I'm great. Good to see you. Good to see you. I feel like How I haven't seen anybody it? outside of my own house and family in a couple of weeks. I know. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Luckily, we have wine and the internet. So, That's true. So we'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, um, I'm super excited that you're joining us. I'm just going to give people a few minutes to um, to log on and join us. But um, for people who are already on, um, we're going to chat with Matt Duncan from Silver Oak um, and Toomey. We're going to taste four wines together. So we're going to taste a uh, the 2018 um, Toomey Sauvignon Blanc. We are going to taste the 2017 Toomey Anderson Valley Pinot Noir. And then we are going to taste the 15 vintage of the Napa and the Alexander Cabernet Sauvignons. So I'm really excited. Correct. I've had these wines before, so I feel very fortunate to taste them again. But, um, you know, I feel like, especially right now, uh, when we're all a little bit isolated, remember that wine still gives us the opportunity to to come together. You know, it was meant to be shared. It was meant to inspire conversation. Uh, be sitting there with you right now. We are still going to um, connect over wine. So, well said, Vanessa. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Well, um, so I think, you know, I, um, we've, we've actually done an event together and I think I mentioned this um, yeah. at the event, but I never like to kind of like wait to start pouring the first glass. So I kind of, I'm gonna go ahead and, this, uh, and, then, uh, and then we can get things going. But here uh, for anyone, uh, at home, we have the Tumi Sauvignon Blanc 2018. I am going to pour my first glass. We'll chat with Matt and then uh, I would I love for mine here. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, this smells delicious. I can't wait to yeah. talk to you about it. But great. All right. Well, for any of you just joining, um, my name is Vanessa Conlin. I am the head of wine for Wine Access. I am thrilled to be here with Matt Duncan. Um, so I, I feel like you see some of these iconic wines, you know, something like like Silver Oak, you know, which has been around since 1972. And they seem sort of, you know, like, unreachable, like, you know, just these hugely famous, prestigious brands. And then it's so refreshing to meet the people behind them because I have to say, Matt, you are absolutely one of my favorite people in Napa. You are so down to earth and so humble and so fun to talk to. And it's so great, I think, that we have this opportunity to kind of bring people, you know, behind the label to uh, to have the yeah. chance to meet you. So first of all, cheers. cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Again, super excited. Um, so Matt, um, I would love, um, I know that, you know, Silver Oak needs no introduction, but just maybe a brief history on on how uh, the winery got started. Um, and then I would love to hear how, uh, how you got involved. Yeah, so thank you, Vanessa. Your words were very kind. We've had a lot of fun together. Um, so the, the quick story of how Silver Oak got started uh, begins in the late 60s and the early 70s when my granddad Ray came out to California um, basically on a, on a hunch that his college roommate Jack Novak had. Um, and what Jack had done, so again there were college roommates, was bought a winery or, or a, a vineyard and was trying to refurbish it into a winery and that, that was the uh, Spotswood Estate in St. Helena. And so my granddad came out and stayed with Jack, and together they decided to partner and buy a vineyard in the Alexander Valley together. And that growing not winemaking and, and not a winery yet. And so the real key turning point for him was when he met a man named Justin Meyer. And Justin uh, had been a priest and he had just retired from the Christian Brothers where he, he was making wine 
And Justin had a vision, and that vision was that Cabernet Sauvignon was really going to be the grape that day in Napa. And you have to remember that at that time, there were so many different varietals uh, planted and so many different varietals that people thought would really define Napa. Uh, the history of the valley is something a little more interesting and, and a little bigger story, but the point is there wasn't a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon. And so when Justin decided that that was really what was going to carry the day in Napa, my granddad thought, you know, fine, great. We'll have a partner and I have a visionary, you know, who's, who can do this with me. And so they bought um, about 280 acres in a little town called Oakville, California, which, of course, is today the heart of the Napa Valley, right in the middle. And uh, what they bought was not a planted vineyard, though. So it was a dairy barn and needed to be planted to vineyards. So that's where Justin came in and his expertise making wine at Christian Brothers and, and growing those grapes. So together they sort of partnered 1972 is that first year. And for, for folks who really look at the history of Silver Oak, or how about this, the brand today, we have Alexander Valley and we have the Napa Valley Caps. We're going to taste them here in a second. Those first images of Silver Oak from 72, 73, 74, those were just North Coast. So the North Coast is the bigger appellation that Napa and Sonoma and Encino County, perfectly right, tasting the Anderson Valley, sit in. So we didn't exactly have enough high-end Cabernet or high-quality Cabernet, I should say, um, from either place back then. And so we blend, blend them together. Um, and that, that's sort of how Silver Oak was born, this, this crazy idea that Cabernet Sauvignon would carry the day when that was not at all a conclusion that other vintners had made. Um, that we would age the wine until it was ready to release. So that's why today, here in 2020, we're tasting two 2015 wines. Those are still our current vintages for Silver Oak. Aged only in American oak barrels, something that uh, distinguished us then and uh, still does today. So, yeah, great. Um, well, before we move on too far, I also want to ask you about what's in the glass. Yeah. Um, so, delicious Sauvignon Blanc. Did you ever think about Blanc, doing yeah. anything? like Chardonnay or did you always have a passion for Sauvignon Blanc? So they hate that. What a beautiful segue. So the, uh, the long, long story uh, made very short about that Oakville property that my granddad bought and Justin helped plant in the early seventies was that it didn't end up being that great for Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, it wasn't, that wasn't very clear. It was on the valley floor in the floodplain and, you know, for my granddad who had grown up on a farm in Illinois and, you know, for Justin who had planted a lot of vineyards um, at that time down on the valley floor, seemed like a pretty easy place to farm because, you know, if you have a flat surface to plant and grow your grapes, well, it's easy to get people through and work, work the land. But uh, the soil was actually much too rich for Cabernet Sauvignon, which, which really needs to struggle uh, to produce high quality grapes. So after many years, we decided that that was no Cabernet Sauvignon that we weren't even using for the Silver Oak blend that we were selling off here on our little estate. So that's when we decided to plant Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, 2007, I think, was the beginning of that um, that change. So really too hot in Oakville on the valley floor for Chardonnay or really any other varietal. I mean, Sauvignon Blanc is just so vigorous that it, it really thrives in the rich soils and, and, the, and the very warm climate. So as you smell the Tumi Sauvignon Blanc, you just get this massive explosion of tropical fruit. And that is, to me, classic Oakville and classic Napa Sauvignon Blanc. But there's a little bit of, of nuance and yin and yang going on in wine, if you like, uh, because the other half of the blend is from our Sonoma Estate Vineyards. Now, Sonoma is very, very different than that tropical, aromatic, just really enticing Sauvignon Blanc. Sonoma, I think, is where you really get surprised on the mouthfeel in this wine where it's a little more savory, you get a little more tree fruit, pear, an apple, something like that. And so you kind of get this really seductive nose and then this really luscious, savory mouth. Um, and after a year in bottle, I think the point has only gotten better. It's, it's delicious. And I think um, it has that beautiful balance of, of like uh, that tropical fruit, fruit that you described, like, but great purity and still it's the, the fruit is definitely, it's, it's lush and it's juicy, but there's a gorgeous acidity that runs, that's like a through line through the palate that really, it just, yeah. it's making me think about what I want for dinner because my mouth is watering. So <laughs> <laughs> really mouth watering. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. A little Sauvignon and a little Sauvignon green there also. So it is a little more nuanced blend than just Sauvignon Blanc, but, uh, we, uh, we work very hard at this, this charming white wine. And what do you like to pair with it? 
Well, I mean, you know, as soon as things heat up here a little bit, oysters are going to be a slam dunk, really any seafood. Um, you can push it, of course, to any fish. A halibut would be beautiful. Um, or, you know, I mean, something that's probably not too rich and overwhelming, but, you know, any kind of chicken would be just fine. Or um, a pasta, a nice, light, fresh spring pasta with pesto. I mean, come on, not going to hurt. Yeah, good. Um, so for anyone who's who's joined us a little late, um, I'm here with Matt Duncan. Uh, we've just tasted the 2018 Tumi Sauvignon Blanc. Um, we are going to keep tasting and keep talking, but I did want to remind everyone that this is meant to be interactive. So if you, if you have any questions for Matt, um, please type them in uh, the chat, and we will answer them at the end. Uh, at the end, so please bring it on. Um, so bring it on. I'll Matt, make up lots of answers. Yeah. Um, so I know from speaking with you a little about this, but I would love for you to share that you're a Duncan, um, your third generation, this is your family's business, but I feel like you're kind of you want to be part of it, right? Can you tell us a little bit about what your first jobs were at, uh, at the winery? Yeah, so I, I started in 2013. Um, so I, after I finished college and I came back and I decided that I wanted to learn what my family business was about, what the business was about. So I walked into my uh, my dad's office and I had my resume and I had a cover letter ready and I had done a couple intern internships in college, nothing that applied to, to farm farm work or grape growing or anything in the wine business. So uh, so I handed it to him. I had it um, maybe about a month waiting to know what you know, what the potential might be. So that first job ended up being working on the bottling line. Uh, so 2013 was that year we were bottling the 2010 Alexander Valley. So my job uh, 10 hours a day was to dump glass, empty bottles, and then uh, go pick them up when they were filled filled with wine and stack the cases up and palletize them and, you know, keep the glue machine going and really take pride in that last step because, you know, once we bottle the wines, that's the last time we touch them. They'll go to age for two more years. That 2010 wasn't released for another a year and a half. And then out to our distributors and out to our restaurants all over the country and all over the world. So, you know, in a way it was sort of saying goodbye to them and that was my first job. Um, then I went into the vineyards and I started uh, doing a number of precision viticulture jobs, which I didn't know what that meant at the time. <laughs> Basically that meant getting up really early to make sure that the vines had enough water. Um, and it was sort of the beginning of, our, of a new understanding for, for our grape growing for Silver Oak and Tumi, which was in effect uh, the, using a lot less water to irrigate our grapes. Um, the, the philosophy of how much water a grapevine needs and the scientific rationale behind that those irrigation decisions was really evolving. So I was kind of on the front line at that. That was getting up at one in the morning and driving all around the North Coast to, to check on the irrigation. Uh, then the sun would come up and I would go do crop estimates. So I'd cut off different green bunches of, of grapes and I'd weigh them in a bucket and I'd write down how many uh, pounds of grapes per two halves of vines in a different block. And then we'd have an idea of what we thought the yield would be. Um, and then it really got fun later in the summer, uh, not that the vineyards and the bottling line was actually fun too, but um, it really got fun when the harvest started. And I went to Toomey, or Toomey West Winery, just outside of Healdsburg. Uh, everybody comes to visit again, comes to visit wine country when all this madness is, is behind us, yeah. we'll be there. And so I helped make the Pinot Noirs um, in 2013. And that meant the really, really fun job of cleaning tanks and cleaning drains and eventually filling barrels when I worked my way up. And, you know, keeping everything spick and span, because that's the key to, to our quality winemaking and that consistency. We don't want any, any funky aromas. We don't want any bacterial growth. So the cellar has to be perfectly clean. And that was what I did uh, my first year to start. Wow. Well, I think it's really refreshing to hear that even though, you know, you're, uh, it's your family business that, you know, you started with the glue machine, which is obviously very important, but, um, you know, not the way a lot of, uh, a lot of family this work, I think. So I think that's great. I think that's great that they kind of made you work for it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pour um, the I'm, Pinot Noir. I'm still working for it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know you are. I know you are. So this is the um, the 2017 vintage Pinot Noir. And uh, I'm you. Obviously, you're so well known for um, for Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Uh, what drew you to also work with Pinot Noir, which I know is not an easy grape to work with. It's very fickle um, and it can be very, very challenging. So what what was it that made you want to kind of venture into this this territory? It is. So, so I, that is a great segue into the story of Tumi and why we have Tumi and not just Silver Oak, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, Silver Oak Merlot or Silver Oak Pinot Noir. And the reason we don't have that is because Silver Oak became so successful and so well known for Cabernet Sauvignon um, very early on. So we first started releasing our, our wines in the late 70s and then through the 80s, really Silver Oak became one of the iconic American Cabernet producers. So we didn't want to screw that up in the 90s when we started to experiment with some other varietals. Um, first, the idea was Merlot and blending into the Silver Oak Napa Valley. And it took us a number of years to find a really, really high quality vineyard in Napa to grow that Merlot. When we did, uh, we realized that we had quite a bit of it in this vineyard called Soda Canyon, Southeast Napa. And so we wanted to bottle a separate Merlot, but we didn't want to call it Silver Oak. And so we thought, all right, well, we'll start a new winery and we'll bottle some Merlot. But if we do that, well, maybe we should think about some other varietals too. And that was that same year in 1999, we signed our first lease on a Pinot Noir vineyard in the Russian River called West Pin, which is part of our Russian River bottling, not the Anderson Valley here. And so sort of simultaneously, in 1999, we really began to open our uh, minds up to different red grapes, Merlot and Pinot Noir. So that first Merlot, 1999, was released in 2002. So, you know, Cabernet producers, we pretty much figured it out uh, pretty quickly how we could make a really, really high quality Merlot. Pinot Noir took a very, very long time. So 1999 was that first vineyard acquisition. Those were um, some challenging wines at first because Pinot Noir is so darn difficult to make all over the world. You know, it's, it's finicky, it's delicate, uh, but when you really hit it, you get a very pretty wine. I, I think the 17 Anderson Valley has, has achieved that. But the, the short way to put the story is we practiced with Pinot Noir um, for almost eight years before we released it. So 2007 was really our first, I think, great Pinot Noir vintage, wines that we were really, really proud of. And we have wines, you know, from the early 2000s that we sort of kept as a family or, or gave to the employees that, you know, weren't really quite uh, ready to be released yet. So it took us a long time to get here. Uh, but the really neat thing about our Anderson Valley Pinots uh, today is that it's a region we're investing in. And so last summer we bought a winery in the Anderson Valley. We, we'd had some vineyards up there for a number of years since 2010. Um, but last year we decided to invest a little more. And so we sent our uh, analogist from Silver Oak Napa. She went up and became the Tumi winemaker in Anderson Valley. And we acquired with this new winery uh, 35 new acres of vineyards. It's really, really cool uh, new plant material to play with. So it's an area we're investing with. It's a, just a unique place to grow Pinot Noir. So um, one of our favorites, absolutely. And how would you describe um what the Anderson Valley imparts into the glass in terms of Pinot Noir in particular, mm. you know, as opposed to other Pinot Noir regions? Uh, well, that's a great question. I think it's, personally, I think the Anderson Valley is the hardest California region to blind taste. And guess what it is? You taste in the Russian River, you're going to get these, br these really round, juicy, full-bodied uh, Pinots, um, usually with a good amount of wood and oak to match up to it. You taste down in Santa Barbara, you're going to get these, these much brighter, floral, bright hibiscus wines. We make a, a Bienacito Pinot um, from the Santa Maria Valley. Or if you go up into Oregon, you're going to get this whole other uh, aspect of really, really savory Pinots. But the Anderson Valley is somewhere in between, and that's, that's a little odd um, for a number of reasons. But for our Pinot, for the, for the 2017 Tumi Anderson Valley Pinot, it's a blend of two vineyards that are... I think that I think really showcase the Anderson Valley well. They're very different. The first one is um, Farrington. So Farrington is a very famous vineyard that we buy a little fruit from, um, sort of in the in the middle of the Anderson Valley. That's the warmest part. And then as you go further north and you get to the coast, you get into the big old growth redwood forest, these massive, massive trees. And that's where we have our monument tree estate. And the monument tree is named so because there's a giant redwood at the top of the vineyard that's been struck by lightning on several occasions. So if you look at the top of the vineyard, and you can see this on our website, the tree has been struck of all its bark and all the limbs at the top, maybe 10 feet. But then the bottom 80, 90 feet of this tree, big, beautiful, alive. And so that is the monument tree on the crest of the hill. Now the wines that we make from that vineyard are a little more nuanced. We actually make a single vineyard from the monument tree also. 
But as we talked about in the Sauvignon Blanc, if you get sort of the yin and yang of the hot vineyard in Napa, the cool vineyard in Sonoma for the Sauvignon Blanc, I think the Anderson Valley is very much uh, conceived in the same way, which is that we have the warm Farrington Vineyard for a little mid palate, a little weight, and then Monument Tree really for this, I think, spectacular structure. Uh, the aromas really come from Monument Tree, um, all that kind of savory intrigue, yeah. which, I mean, it's always a different, uh, surprising, so. It's, it's beautiful. And do you have a favorite pairing for this? Well, that's a good question. So the last night um, in, you know, day, gosh, whatever we are, 14 or something of, of our staying at home, I decided I would make lasagna from scratch. So I took out some uh, tomatoes from uh, my garden last year, which I had frozen, and I made a sauce. And I rolled out some pasta that I made by myself with the uh, eggs from my uh, my dad's house he's he's got chickens and so we rolled it all up and mushrooms and, and so it's still in there in the fridge yeah, i think it's better after a day coming together so i think yeah. with a you know a little weight savory cheese and then of course the bright acid in the tomato i mean i think that's a beautiful pairing for the anderson valley pinot you know. sounds delicious so i'm going to pour uh the two cabernet sauvignon side by side because i thought that's it would it. be fun to compare them so um we have the 2015 uh, vintage of the Silver Oak Alexander Valley. And we also have the 2015 vintage of Silver Oak Napa Valley. Um, so Matt, you, you're um, known for working with American Oak. Um, I don't know that everyone knows that you actually own your own Cooper. Could you tell us a bit about why you think that's important to to own your own and um and why did you choose to work with american oak well why did we choose to work with american oak uh that is a is a great story i think that you know really goes back to justin's um winemaking palette but but more his expertise when when silver oak first started in the early 70s so justin as i said before had been at christian brothers now, Christian Brothers, he was making all kinds of different wines. He was making Cabernets, but he was making Zinfandels, and he was making Napa Gamays and, you know, Beaujolais and all kinds of stuff uh, that we don't <laughs> put under those names in Napa, California anymore. But back at that time, they were. And so he had experience in all kinds of different oak. He had experience, of course, in American oak and French oak and Hungarian oak and maybe some other, probably even redwood, um, come to think of it. So Justin, by the time uh, we started making wine for what became Silver Oak, had a pretty good idea of what kind of flavor he wanted. Now, to give you sort of a quick understanding of the difference between American oak and French oak, American oak is really going to impart much more of the vanilla flavors, a lot less tannin. French oak, you're going to get a little more, more savory, spice box tannins, um, and, a lot, and a lot richer tannin, I guess, in general, darker tannin. Um, and so because we're in California, we're in a warmer climate, and the grapes here, particularly the Cabernet, grow much thicker skins than they do elsewhere around the world as sort of a sunblock uh, to insulate them from that warmer climate. We tend to extract much more tannin from our uh, Napa Cabernets. And so the idea behind American oak really is to pair that uh, level of more intense tannin from the, from the fruit and the grapes with less intense tannin in, uh, in the oak barrels. But that comes with a trade-off because you get much more of that warm vanilla and flavor in the American oak. So, that aesthetic and that style has really become synonymous with uh, Silver Oak. I think there are a number of other wonderful producers that use American Oak, but Silver Oak is really, really known for the American Oak profile. So if you're known for this particular flavor, well, you better invest everything you can in it, and you better make them the best barrels you can. So we partnered with uh, the AK Cooperage in Higby, Missouri. Um, gosh, I, it was probably the late 70s, the first time Justin went out there and found them. Um, and used their barrels and partnered with them for a number of years. In the 90s, I believe, we uh, bought half of the business, so we became 50-50 partners in this cooperage. And then in 2015, actually the vintage that we're drinking, uh, we bought the cooperage outright. So it's a huge, huge part of sort of quality and consistency, and that's why we invested in it. Got it. And I think I actually switched, switched the bottles when I introduced them, but because this is the Alex, and then Mm. The Napa, mm -hmm. uh, I think I did that backwards. But I, I'm curious. I mean, I I have them in my glass side by side. But for those at home who don't, how do I have the difference between Alexander Valley and Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley? 
Well, that's a great question. I, they are so different, and uh, it's really remarkable how many Silverbrook fans have an opinion about which one they like better. And I, we could probably take a poll in the chat, you know, who likes Napa better, who likes Alexander Valley better, because they are so different. And the question... So the Alexander Valley, since that's what we're tasting first, uh, since I don't have a map, everybody will have to, you know, sort of imagine it. Um, the Alexander Valley in Sonoma is closer to the Pacific Ocean, so it's closer to the coast and generally gets a greater uh, influence from the coastal fogs. It's a long way of saying it's a cooler place to grow grapes. Napa's hotter. So the cooler climate in the Alexander Valley produces, I think, these much brighter red fruits, much higher toned uh, wines. Whereas Napa Valley is a little darker, that, that warmth and that heat that you get with an extra uh, mountain range, effectively, the Mayacamas, holding back the fog uh, even, even further or actually preventing any fog from coming in. And so the fog that does make it into Napa has to come from the south and the bay. Um, so Napa, you get these darker fruits because there's much less coastal influence, whereas the Alexander Valley, you know, the fog will sit there and keep, the, keep it much cooler, so bright red, high-toned uh, fruits. Got it. So we have a, a question. Um, so David Meyer would like to know how are the wines from the 70s and the 80s holding up because he has some in his cellar. Ooh. Uh, that's a very good question. So it depends which ones. So um, from the 70s, the you know I, I know for a fact, the 73 vintage, our second vintage, every bottle that I've ever had, you know, maybe a dozen times, um, yeah, I wish it does, <laughs> maybe a little less, um, is just a wonderful, wonderful wine. How that is with grapes that we had from Napa and Sonoma blended together in places that, you know, have not held up to be truly great vineyards over the years, um, that's, that's just spectacular. 78, another great uh, year for the Alexander Valley wine. Uh, 82, I think, is probably the first First very strong vintage still holding up uh, today. Um, gosh, almost 40 years later, isn't that crazy? Um, and as a, as a sort of aside, if you have any of those bottles from, you know, well, the early 80s or the 70s, it's very cool to go back on the, let's see, do I have them? Uh, no, to go on the back of the label and see what the little tag said and what, what Justin wrote about the wines, because his vision was that the wines would last maybe seven to eight years after we bottled them. This is really in the 70s, but I imagine it still said that uh, in, the, in the early 80s. And so his vision was for these wines to maybe give, you know, be enjoyable for a decade after, you know, release or, or since the vintage. And what, what I found is a lot of them have really, really held up well, particularly the 82s, the 85s, and another just stellar vintage, the 85 Alexander Valley, just a wonderful, wonderful wine. Um, and that's really remarkable. I think it, it speaks to Justin's well, of course, his talent as a winemaker, but then his stylistic vision to pair it with American oak and to really hold those tannins back so that as the wines age, you know, you're going to lose all that fruit. You're not going to get the juicy, sexy, dark Napa cab anymore, California cab for that matter. Um, but it's okay because you're not going to have these massive tannins sort of, you know, putting themselves on top um, and superimposing themselves over that uh, lighter fruit. So... I think it's remarkable that, that it, you know, those wines have made it so long. Um, the wines that we're drinking today are a little different. The 2015 vintages were pretty warm, and so it's a pretty small crop. So we've given these different guarantees, but it's a little, a little uh, further out than just in 78 years were uh, for those 70s wines. Uh, the 2015 Alexander Valley, which we're still just drinking now, we've guaranteed through 2041, so for 25 wow. years, or 26 years. Um, and that guarantee means that we'll replace the bottle. So if people, you know, buy it and they put it in their cellar and they don't like the way it's aged and they tell us that they aged it, you know, temperature controlled and no light and all that kind of stuff, um, then we replace it um, up through 2041. So that's really the guarantee and the quality of the silver wines today that, you know, we think about them uh, as very long-term aging wines. The 2015 Napa, which we'll try next, not quite as long. Uh, it, it's a, a little higher alcohol than we normally um, find ourselves making for silver oak. And so that, about 2038, uh, is our guarantee. But, you know, these are still long, long-term aging wines. Uh, and we've always been a little too conservative uh, with it, which is, you know, the Justin's story in a nutshell, um, you know, for a wine that he hoped would last, you know, seven to eight years to make it almost 40 and still be lovely. Um, I think so a lot. 
Got it. So speaking of the Napa, and moving on to that, um, I know so that- So let's see, I think the question is the 79 to 84 bar. No, sorry, I was just saying, the, I guess the question is 79 to 84, so I would say, <clears throat> if I could presume uh, so much, the, those 82s are probably the best uh, if you have the Alex or the Napa or the Bonnies in there. Um, I had the 82, um, what was it? Oh, Napa, the 82 Napa at a Magnum um, just a couple weeks ago, just before the quarantine started. Uh, we were at a, a fundraiser, and a, and a dinner friend of my uncle's uh, brought it, and, uh, and I drank Oh, more than half the bottles. <laughs> anyway, that tells you about the 82 Napa, lovely wine. Um, the 79, probably still pretty interesting. 70 or um, 83 possibly, but the, the 80 and 81 are probably past their prime. They were pretty difficult vintages, um, and I have not known them to be too stellar, but uh, which is a nice way of saying I think they're done. The 84 could be okay too, but really the 80, the 82 in particular is a very nice wine in there with a, a slight side note to 79. I bet that's still lovely. But with plenty of sediment and you know needs to be decanted ahead of time, um, but not too far ahead of time, because if it starts falling apart, you want to be able to enjoy it uh, with your dinner. The eighty-two won't fall apart, but the, I bet the eighty and eighty-one would. Got it. So the fifteen Napa is gorgeous, and I know that the um, your release parties are kind of legendary. You know, obviously we're not gathering uh, these days, but assuming you know. No. It, <laughs> we're able to actually drink wine face to face again. Um, I have a question, and that is, um, how does one get invited to the release party at Silver Oak? Ah, well, um, it. Look <laughs> um, so the idea behind release day is really that everybody or Silver Oak fans from around the world, how about this? And it truly is around the world. We had people from um, all over the country, but Indonesia and Europe uh, this, past, this last time uh, in February, uh, the Philippines too. And the idea is to celebrate the new vintage. So the first day that the wine's released, the 16 Alexander Valley will be released on August 1st of this year, hoping we get uh, all the current challenges behind us and we can uh, get you know hundreds of people together is um, is our next release date uh, for Silver Oak. And so that wine will, will gather again and everybody will come to Silver Oak to taste only one wine. There's no library wine. There's a little Sauvignon Blanc because it'll be hot. But otherwise, uh, everybody gathers just to taste the new vintage. Got it. Wow. Well, we are um, getting close to time, but um, yeah. I want to thank you so much yeah. for joining us. And I also wanted to say congratulations because you are a new grad. <laughs> uh, I am, and also and I'm actually uh, broadcasting, if you like, from what's going to be our nursery. Uh, we have a little baby boy coming at the end of July and uh, we've redone what was my office, but I'm using it one more time here today. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. And I have a question for you then. Um, so what wine did you drink at your wedding and Ooh, what well, wine are you going to open when uh your baby is born well i have it i have it right here funny you should ask what we drank at our wedding because i i needed a big bottle i thought for the background so uh, i have a three liter here of the 1990 silver oak alexander valley uh we had some large format tumies also but uh, this is what we had got it wow and, and then, then when, when was the baby born? Yeah, well, well, gosh, when he's born, I shouldn't say this, but we'll probably drink champagne, I think. <laughs> but, um, but then 20, the 2020 vintage uh, will be his. And so for all the wines that we've tasted today, uh, we will make again in 2020 this year. And those wines will save for him, like my dad did. Um, 1989 was the year I was born. And, um, you know, when he turns 21, they'll be his, and we'll save big bottles and small bottles, and, and you know, it's too early to say how the 2020 vintage is shaping up, but uh, it'll it'll remind him of the world he was born into, so. Got it. Well, congrats again, and thank you again for joining us. It's, you know, so important, I think, that we stay connected, and, you know, wine, as we were talking about at the beginning, like, 
wine was meant to really bring people together and inspire conversation. And even though we're not tasting together, um, I'm so honored to have spent this time with you and for everyone joining us from home. Thank you so much. Cheers. And um, thanks to Matt Duncan. We'll see you. We have an amazing schedule. Thanks, um, online, so, so keep checking back and we'll be posting uh, about future events there. So cheers. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Have a nice weekend. Bye.